Miss my cards. Nigerian time. God bless you all. You're welcome. My name is Olumide Emmanuel, and I'm going to be your host for the next one hour. I believe we'll be able to knock this off in one hour because all the different ministers of the gospel that will be joining me are extremely busy people that have taken time out to make this sacrifice to join me. So we're going to see how we can knock everything off within one hour. Joining me tonight will be Pastor Boju Oyemadi of the Covenant Nation. And then tomorrow night, we have Pastor Yemi David. Wednesday is our midweek service, so we'll be in church. And then on Thursday, we have Pastor Godman at Kinlabi. And then on Friday, we have Bishop Shegun Oshinaga. And then next week, Monday, we start all over again with Reverend K. E. G. Sheson. And then on Tuesday, we have Jerry Eze. And we also have Tokwe Alabi. So Tuesday next week, we'll be back to back. It will be two sessions. We have one hour with Jerry Eze, and one hour with Tokwe Alabi. And then we're also going to be having Bolaji Ido. So many of these ministers will be joining me all through this month as we look at sustainability secrets. Now, let me give you a, bit, a brief background of why I'm doing this, um, because uh, uh, we're going to be doing this all through this month. Uh, I got born again as a teenager. I became a pastor at the age of 21. Uh, before my 25th birthday, I'd become an overseer of a ministry. I still have the privilege to pass up till today. So I became what in those days they used to call founder or whatever. In those days. So I became a founder. Now they talk about general overseer and all those stuff before the age of 25. And I've been around for a while. Uh, so in the month of October, it will be 34 years that I've been in ministry, 34 years. And um, in the last few months, a lot of things have happened with reference to um, some encounters I've had with some people, some people that I've met, you know, people I used to know in the 80s and the early 90s that have just disappeared from the scene. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm seeing many some. I'm like, ah, come, this guy used to be a pastor, you know? And then I'm thinking, I'm like, wow, <laughs> like, play like, play to be 34 years or so. Uh, what are the things that has helped us to be able to stay, you know, sustainable? And I have mentors, I have people that when we started out in the 80s, there were people that were like, wow, these are men of God that we're looking up to and drawing inspiration from. And then looking back now, some of them are still alive, but it's like, what's happening to these people? What's happening? So we want to just talk about sustainability. So um, as I'm preparing to you know, move on into other things, the minister, I'm like, wow, it's been a while. And then recently, we also had one of our generals pass on to glory. And that also brought up the issue of succession. And when you look into the body of Christ, you see that a lot of people that have gone ahead of us, mo most of the time, when people pass on, it seems as if once they pass on, the ministry uh, just begins to dwindle in impact. So we, we, we're going to be looking at what are the sustainability secrets, what are the things that will help people to stay fresh and relevant in ministry. And then we're also going to be looking at, you know, the issue of succession with reference to sustainability and transition of ministries. Um, I'm, apart from being a pastor, I'm also a businessman. I'm the CEO of the Common Sense Group. I run nine different companies um, with a global footprint. So I'm also in the marketplace. And as part of my assignment in the marketplace, I host an annual event called the Business Sustainability Secret Summit. Uh, so the Business Sustainability Summit is coming up this end of the month. So I just thought, look, while I'm preparing for uh, 34 years in ministry, let's just talk about sustainability. And um, if you're a businessman or a businesswoman, will probably be able to give you opportunity to join um, in that because um, that's an opportunity you need to be a part of. So I want to check to see if Pastor Podju is with us already. I'm going to be bringing him on so that we can just start the journey because the journey is far. <laughs> and we want to draw as much as we can draw from this phenomenal uh, man of God that has been a tremendous blessing And just draw from him. So it's going to be our first uh, guest for this series. And so please, um, when he begins to talk, you need to get your notes because these are heavy guys. When they talk, you have to take notes and begin to ah uh, welcome man of God. <laughs> 
How are you? I'm doing well. Oh, well done for all the journey, journey, journey. Are you finally back? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you can hear me. Perfectly well. Perfectly all well. Right. Yeah. All right, then. You are, you are welcome, Mo. Uh, it's Thank an honor you so to much. have you. Honor to have you join me. This is the first time we are doing Mr. Life together. So thank you for the sacrifice to come and join me on this journey. <laughs> so you're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. All uh, right, as well. We have so many things to cover. So let me just give you a brief. Um, well, I've said next month, um, I'm going to be 34 years in ministry next month. And um, looking back i know you also started you know in the in the late 80s and so in the late 80s early 90s when we started out um there are a lot of people that were in ministry then that were like wow these are the guys and then in the 80s in the 90s even the early 2000s and somehow you see a lot of people they come into ministry 10 15 years later you don't seem to hear about them anymore some 20 some 25 and they just disappear and for many of them, I remember when we were on campus in those days, growing up as young people, they told us to be careful of women, money, and pride. And they told us these three things can kill anybody. And looking back, we can see that many of these people is the same thing. We've read books like God's General. We've seen people come and go, uh, finishing strong, straight far. We've seen all kinds. So as I'm preparing for 34 years next month, uh, I'm just thinking, oh, let's do something and just hear, because I see a lot of people also in ministry today and sometimes the way some of these guys do the streets is as if I'm like, we have seen all this thing before now. Well, you guys are just here. You better follow the you know, people building ministry around the gift, building ministry around the doctor. You know, I'm like, you have to build this on the world. People have come and gone. All this thing you are doing, we have seen it before. It will last. So I just thought, let's do this, bring in some of the frontline ministers that I minister today to share their secrets. You've been around for a while. Uh, for decades, at least. I've known you now for well, well over two decades, almost three decades, and I've seen the hand of God upon your life and your journey. So I want to learn from you and from your experience. You've hosted some of the most phenomenal events, bringing in fathers of faith, frontline ministers to help the body. Uh, Wafbeck is a major, major one. So you are welcome. So I want to start by looking at that. So you, how long have you been in ministry? And we're going to start with your work with God. What has kept Kept passed up on you. Why have you not fallen? <laughs> what are the things that has kept you in life, in ministry? What are those things? Jesus Christ said in Matthew, I think Mark 3:14, He said, He chose the disciples that they might be with Him and then He might send them to go and work for Him. So being with God is more important than working for God. So that's why the focus will be your work with God. What are those things you do personally that is keeping you? before we now look into the work for God. So you're welcome. Thank you very much. Great honor to, to be here and to, um, to share um, this anniversary with you. All right, I, I, as, you were, as you were speaking, I was really thinking what you were saying. And very, very true analogy of the country. I remember um, that almost Six years ago, I had many young people. Well, uh, I had staff that were quite young. I just employed them, and they were young. So I wrote a list of ministers, and these were ministers that, um, I mean, when you have conferences in Nigeria, that's this is the top six of them. And I wrote their names down, or sub top, sir, and I placed it before them. And these were people who were in their 20s. And I said, do you know this person? They said, no. Do you know this person? No. Do you know this person? No. Do you know? Among all the seven people I called, the only name that person they knew and were current with it, uh, then was Bishop Oyedepo. The rest of the people, they didn't know. Now, it wasn't possible for you to be a Christian in the early 90s without you knowing these people, without going for their meetings or going to or them coming to churches or being in meetings where they were. So, I mean, it's quite, if you look at it naturally, I mean, that should start to, all right, um, someone. So, I mean, it's, this, this is very important. Um, I would just say, and I will elaborate on that, but in terms of personal work with God, I think the, the first thing I would say is um, you have 
to have a solid prayer life because that's how you develop the stamina to stand your call. And when I say a solid prayer life, I'm not talking about a prayer life that is based on just asking God for needs or you have a challenge and then you begin to pray. I'm talking about you just spending um, lengthy times in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. Not necessarily asking God for anything, but praying burdens through. Uh, praying, if you feel heavy, you start praying and you feel there's not a flow, you stay there in the place of prayer until you get a flow, you hit what we'll call the gosha and just push through in the place of prayer. I believe that practice, all right, makes you, uh, it's like you are, you, are, you, are, you are training and you are running and practicing and you develop spiritual stamina to be able to stand the rigors of your call. Because any person who is called of God and is going to want to fulfill the things of God is going to come under spiritual attacks that you never imagined, you know, you'll face in your life. Uh, you are going to meet with different types of people. Um, you you can even get confused if you don't have your your uh, compass set right. The second is that you have to also know the place of God's word in the life of a believer. I'm not talking about reading the Bible so that you can go and preach properly, or reading the Bible to demonstrate uh, knowledge to people. Or reading the Bible and studying it as the food that you eat. In other words, when you study the Word of God, you are actually feeding your own self and eating food and understanding the process through which you digest that food into your system so you can strengthen yourself. The third is to learn to walk in forgiveness. You cannot, uh, um, you can't, you will wither away once you get offended. Mm -hmm. And and there will be. It is impossible that offenses will not come. And if you don't, uh, you know, understand, all right, the love work, and understand that I've got to surmount offenses and and keep my heart free. And um, uh, wherever your joy stops is where your journey in life with God stops. So once the joy has disappeared, based on Many times the treatment people get from members of the body of Christ, many times there, yeah. um, you know, people, you know, develop resentment on the inside. And once you develop an offense, to begin to wither, your ministry, the strength of your ministry will begin to wither. And if you don't deal with it quickly, all right, after some time, people just will not care about you again. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Um, we see, um, while growing up, um, I, I, just want to say, have... I just want to say one. I just want to say something here that will help people. Okay. I do okay. not know any minister mm. of the gospel who got offended ten years ago and did not get rid of it. That has impact today in ministry. Now, mm. I will say something here for so that the people can learn. I walked into the office of somebody one day in 1990. And he was a front runner in ministry in this country. And he didn't know I was coming in. So as I was coming into, the, into his building, he was there with members of his staff. And he made a derogatory remark about a senior minister in this country. And I could see that he was deeply offended by that minister, who on the outside, it looked like this was the principal minister in his life as let's say like a father of faith. Now, what now happened was, we got into a conversation, because I, I was around there for a while. So it got into, as I knew him for a while, a conversation with him. And he said to me, he didn't know I heard what he said, all right, because he gave me a front like, oh, you know, I have a problem with this. But, but well, we got down to a conversation and he told me that he had a meeting and he invited this minister to come and preach and that he spent all the money that they had in their church account to bring this great minister. And he told him, and as far as he was concerned, there was an understanding, as far as he was concerned, that there's an understanding that when you come and preach, you'll raise an offering for me, from my people, and they were going to give back. And the minister finished preaching and then raised an offering and dropped the mic and left. 
But the point there was that that offense was in his heart for years. Mm. All right. Mm. And, and this was a potent minister, powerful guy in this country. And if I call his name, I don't think people listening here will know who he is. Five, maybe mm. only just 5% of people listening here will know. So offense is something. And the reason why I said, talked about prayer there is that you, you, the Bible says in the day of adversity, uh, if you fall, it's because your strength is small. And the scripture mm. says, man, always ought to pray and not to faint so if you don't have that prayer life you'll be hit by curved balls so, i mean I, I understood where the man was coming from as in that his understanding was ah but i told him and i mean that one and i mean where he was where how hot he was but but it was a he, he was he was wounded in his spirit and, and I, a lot of ministers in this country that happened to them wow wow um why growing up we what's like quiet time morning devotion were part of yeah. what we grew up with so all you are talking about now many of us have been privileged to still work in that 30 40 years later after we got born again but there seemed to be a shift in this generation and i don't think um so what do you think is the issue because okay at the risk of being misunderstood i'm so grateful to go for the revival we're having with reference to all these online prayers and all the stuff. But I personally believe that the online prayer movement that we're having is more or less a proof of lack of personal prayer in the life of individuals. I stand to be corrected. Because if you have a personal prayer work with God, I think you should be busy praying at that time for your You should have your own personal time. When, you know, because a lot of people today, they don't have a personal prayer life. So what went wrong? Is it with the pastors that are guilty? Is it that we are no more teaching? Because I personally believe that preaching um, inspires, preaching motivates, preaching steers up, but it is teaching that disciples people. So is it that the church has oh, not okay. taught? Okay, so, let me, okay, so let, let me answer it. Yeah, let, let me try to answer what you're saying, but I'll compartmentalize it. Now, first, first of all, as my practice, um, I, I think that not I, I, God meets people at the level where they are. In other words, if um, the woman with the issue of blood says, "If I can touch the, the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole," she touches the hem of his garment, she's whole. Uh, Peter didn't understand it at that particular point in time. Jesus said, "Somebody has touched me." Peter said, "I don't know." All right, the same Peter later on. All right, um, went and um, asked Jesus to lay hands on his mother in law. So people do have levels. So I believe God meets with people at levels. So I believe that there are people that, you know, may not have prayer life, may, I don't understand this, and they need to be ministered to in a certain way. So I believe that God, all right, will reach people at the place and the point where he wants to reach them. Because if those people don't have any form of ministry to them, then they are left with a consciousness that they can begin to question whether God is in existence, why is it that God hasn't helped me, and all of that. All right, so let me put that down. But I get what you are saying, and it's a very valid point. And we just finished the pastor's conference, and I explained something at the pastor's conference. And I believe something happened in the body of Christ in Nigeria which cost us badly, and it is showing. Um, what happened was, um, there, there was a, a lot of the frontline ministers today in Nigeria went to Tulsa and learned from, from people like Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, and came in. However, I believe, this is my own personal opinion now, I believe that when some of them came in and began to, to practice, they realized that the cultural setting in Nigeria was different from the cultural setting in America. Mm -hmm. um, so they adjusted their ministries to fit the cultural setting that they met in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And the cultural setting in Nigeria, as it were, because of the CSA revival and the background of the move of God that had been in the spirit, there was a lot of direct ministry and, and the use of things in terms of doing ministry. I think a good number of the teachers got offended at what they saw. 
I know this to be true, and began to attack it. Now, in attacking it, I, I think that I believe that that was that, that was where the mistake was. Now, what they should have done was to have looked at it and said, "Look, something is happening here in Nigeria. People are getting results this way. Uh, we are teachers of God's word. Let us explain. People are even getting results that they don't even understand how they're getting the results, but they just get the results. If we explain to the people." what really is going on in this move of the spirit that we are seeing, that we can stabilize the people and even tell them that you can increase the impact of what is happening here if you do have this particular background that is within your life. I think they went, they got offended at what they were saying, and they attacked. Once they began to attack, those teaching ministries began to wither. Now, once the teaching ministries began to wither, the people that would have laid a foundation for certain things, probably those things, all right, uh, were no longer there. So we, the, the, the church was now left with um, something that people could look at today and say uh, this, this, this. But God ministers to people in the way in which people will be able to receive it. So I believe that, all right, I've, and I've heard people say things and say that, but I believe that teachers, again, shouldn't make this second mistake again all right i believe that and it's clear that there is an authentic online ministry that evolved out of covid during the covid time i think the church um, god used it to show people that you can minister all right for example i i mean the first time i ever did ig live was during covid like this and i think people began to develop ways in which that we can actually have a conversation where people are getting blessed and we are all in our living rooms in different places. So what, what you're saying, what you're saying, the essence of what you're saying is correct, right? But then at the same time also, I think that um, 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 that's where some people are, all right? Some, some, it, it, the problem is that's where some people are. All right, which means that some people just wake up and they have problems and say, look, let's go and meet God and God ministers to them. And then those people, I mean, if things are properly explained to them, just like Jesus took um, Peter, he caught abundance of fish and then he can be led into discipleship and then he can become an apostle. So at, at the point of entry, in terms of first point of contact, that's fine. All right. Um, and I believe that... Um, uh, those who have the teaching anointing and gift within the body of Christ should, um, um, and who have been around for long, should use a lot of maturity in navigating what is going on, all right, in the body of Christ, understanding what is happening and um, teaching a context where um, um, we don't repeat the mistakes of what happened um, back Dead. because because there are the the a lot of of teachers in nigeria um a sound teachers in nigeria drowned in that um ocean of of offenses and it's because they didn't understand that look there was a move of the spirit before tulsa came in people like mm. prophet Abadari were gathering thousands in Ibado. the cac movement was that i mean i would grow up hearing hallelujah hallelujah you know they'll say things like hallelujah then my other hallelujah i mean somebody says that to people that came from i say what are you saying here hallelujah what is that you know what is all about but those people brought power to their people and ministered there and i i think what people should have done was and when some of the people who were faith teachers saw that look africans this how they receive things then should have merged it, all right, in a cohesive way and said, okay, I see what's going on, all right, right here, and I do this. So I, 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 I believe that during COVID, God opened up a door to online, all right, ministry uh, globally, all right, but he did not sacrifice the fundamental principles of that. So I believe that um, um, uh, the teachers should be able to look at it, study what is going on there, see what is actually happening and then explain an integrated message that when they pass across to people people don't feel that, that some people are being attacked you know to because once people feel like you're attacking people they just 
And it's not even good for the heart of the person who is ministering. Yeah. So that's balance. What balance is not good. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's move on because of time. Now, um, you mentioned offenses, and um, in mentioning offenses, you gave us a case study of what led to the offense of the particular person in question. Help me raise offering, they did this offering. So that comes to the issue of money. Yeah. And when I was speaking earlier, and I said, when we're growing up, we're made to realize that if we're going to do well in ministry, um, I say to people, don't bother to rise if you plan to fall, because once you fall, the God of second chance, not many people, God is a God of second chance, but not many people will give you a second chance. So, Money, women, and pride. These three things, and the one we look from scripture, loss of the eyes, loss of the flesh, pride of life, has ruined a lot of ministers. Looking back, 80s, 90s, and yes, yeah, so how have you been able to survive? What are those things? I know you spoke about prayer. So from your own work with God, before we go into the work, how have you been able to survive the temptation of money, temptation of women, temptation of pride and arrogance? see what I have done, like Nebuchadnezzar, see my kingdom. So I haven't been able to undo that because we see a lot of young guys. When we started on campus, I was still telling one of my friends um, we, in Canada last week, we've not seen for, okay, for like 30 something years. And when we were in campus in the 80s, we had 700 people as students, 700. Wow. In the wow. campus, in the lab, 700 people. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. But these campus boys of now, they should see people on campus now. They have PA, they have uh, all kinds of entourage. And they are, I'm like, what's so how have you been able to survive? To stay strong, to avoid getting proud and arrogant, well, to okay, avoid let, falling okay, to the okay, let, trap. Okay, let me, trap. Let, let me say this here about, um, I mean, for campus fellowships and the way and direction in which it has gone, like you mentioned, I have noticed this. It's a shame, uh, it's a shame that um, people at an early stage, at this is a real shame, have gotten themselves into all these PA and all of that and that. Okay, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying it's it's everything, but I don't. I as I'm like this, I don't. I mean, you have people that function as assistants that help me, but I don't do PA and all of that, okay? I don't uh, as a person, all right? But, but it's a shame that they've done that. But I, uh, the one thing I, I believe that has helped, you see, because, I, I'm, let me just say this here, the, the turnaround of ministries back then was very high. In other words, what used to happen is people would go up and come down, people would go up and come down. People, I mean, turnaround was high. And um, I think, when Archbishop Idaosa came on the scene and he began to mentor ministers, I think we got to a point we had more stability in ministry, which means that they were longevity and then Pastor Adipoye came and began to mentor and so longevity came in. I believe, and I, I say this here, Pastor Adipoye as a person to the body of Christ does more by his presence than even by any other thing that he does, just his presence, all right? His presence, all right, releases things into the body of Christ. Number one, you can see how, how much has been accomplished, all right, through him, what is going on in Redeemed Church of God. And if he remains simple, then it will almost amount to madness for you to have a minute fraction of that and uh, a minute fraction of that and begin to walk in pride. So he's simply his approach to things in ministry has done that so I, I mean it will it will be funny for anybody uh, you see people like uh, Bishop Ridley people like Pastor Adipo you see all they've done there and you think you have arrived all right with uh, what you have so I think a, ma massive examples like that have helped younger ministers to look and still know that look I may have 100 churches uh, they are doing well but Look, these are people that are opening 10,000 churches a year. So it is I mean, what, what am I saying I'm proud about? So I think that has helped people. Uh, um, the issue of pride also is that if you genuinely are seeking for results, genuinely got kind of results in life, then, um, then the issue of pride, I think, because you have to learn, and, and that's what, that's where you have to humble yourself. On the issue of money, okay, 
I, I think these examples I've given also help people on the issue of uh, money. I must say this so that um, we are blessed as a generation because the previous generation taught the body of Christ at their own expense about money, about giving. So what, what happened was they took a lot of heat for teaching people about money. So people don't have to teach teach Christians today too much about money, all right, for pe people to understand that they give and they do all of that, they minister to people. So um, that, um, however, in everything that we talk about, I think, um, um, I think simplicity, all right, simplicity is the core of what people are doing. In other words, uh, just leave a simple life don't try to impress anybody have goals for yourself if you don't meet those goals then it means you have you don't know as you ought to know and you need to learn all right and um, always keep your eyes on people that are way ahead of you so that you don't get self-conceited um at the at the at the level which you are to keep yourself out of pride wow wow Amazing, amazing, amazing. If you are listening to us, you are watching Sustainability Secrets. My name is Olubide Mano, and joining me tonight is Pastor Boju Yemadi. And we're looking at things that can help us to be able to sustain our work with God and our work for God. At this point, before we continue, I would like to um, just recommend a few materials to some of you that will be a blessing to you. If you're a young minister or you are a frontline minister, um, many years ago, there's a book written by Dr. Mike Mudok. It's called The Young Minister's Handbook. Young Minister's Handbook. This book, um, there are a lot of things there that have, you know, expired over time because of uh, technology. But uh, this book is very good. So get a copy of this book if you can. I don't know if it's still in print. And then there's a book that is called Finishing Strong. Finishing Strong by Steve Farr. I couldn't get it. So many books in the library. I was trying to search it out. I couldn't get that one. But go ahead, get it. Still far. Finish it strong. It will help you, especially if you're a young minister and uh, you're a minister of the gospel. And then this one is from Dr. Miles Morrow. It's called Passing It On. Passing It On by Dr. Miles Morrow. It's also a very good book that will help you with reference to succession and all the stuff. Then this one is called The Effective Minister's Wife by Pastor Faith Oedeko, the effective minister's wife. It will help you because uh, marriage is very, very important. And um, many people have issues where their marriages have ended up becoming one of the reasons why they are not able to fulfill what they need to fulfill. And then, um, of course, the school of money, because money is very, very important. And um, a lot of people have had issues with all these full-time ministry issues. We have a lot of ministers that do not understand how to bring in balance to that. I say to people that uh, full-time ministry means that ministry should be your primary assignment, not your only assignment. Ministry should be your primary assignment, not your only assignment. And we need to have balance with that. And you don't go into full-time until your hands are full. So get all these materials. There will be a tremendous blessing to you because a lot of people, you have 12 members, say you're full-time. And then you end up becoming a thief and a liar because the whole offering cannot even take care of anything. And then you, the money you are supposed to use to build the ministry, you are using it to take care of your personal need. So get this material. There are many other materials that will help you. And then, like I said, on the 29th of September, I'm hosting the Business Sustainability Summit. That's not for pastors, it's for business people. Next year, when I'm doing 35 years, we're going to have a sustainability summit for pastors, you know, building to last and really deal with issues that we are talking about this week but if you're a businessman you want to be a part of that you can follow me on my social media platform join me on instagram get in touch with us and know how you can join us for the business sustainability secret so let's go into part two work for god all right you have built a work that has become a major inspiration to the body of christ so and we know a lot of churches that have started and folded up of course I can mention churches now that, oh, that's true, that's true, they are gone. They used to be there, and we don't even know whether they are they shadow of themselves. I've, because I'm into real estate, I've been, unfortunately, part of having to sell churches, where churches are 
the, the overseer died, they have branch here, nobody, they were about to sell the churches to other churches. We were about to sell one church to a, a tile manufacturing factory, tile, you know, she may see. They are manufacturing tile, in, in the, you know, so, and this was a church. Because I'm a real estate, I'm like, ah, church, there be, you know, how, where would this man of God, you know, because, so how have you been able to sustain Covenant Christian Center, now Covenant Nation? How, what are the secrets that has helped you to be able to keep this work growing? And just expand there. And now you are just opening branches everywhere. Leaders I, I, everywhere, I, I, everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Covenant well, Nation. Everywhere. Well, I, I think they, I actually think that, um, and I thought about this recently, I think the, the biggest, okay, let me put it this way. There was, there was a, a man who wanted to climb a tree. And there was an elderly man at the base of the tree. And as the man was climbing the tree, he said, um, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. And then he climbed. No, no, no. He didn't say anything to him. The man climbed up the tree and he didn't say anything. It was difficult. He struggled. And he got to the top. And then when he was coming down, the man now said, be careful. Watch your step. Watch your step. Be careful. Watch your step. Look, watch your step and all of that. And when the man got down, he said, "What? what's the issue here? When I was going up, which was really difficult and the task of seemed very tall, you did not say anything. When I was coming down, after I'd conquered it, I was coming down, he started shouting. And he said, look, people don't need, to, when they're trying, they don't really need people to tell them, be careful, because they, they are tempted. It's once they feel that they have mastered something, that mm. they now have a problem and can start making real mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that happens to people um, in ministry and in church work is the feeling that I have now succeeded in ministry. Once you get that, that feeling that I'm now a successful person in ministry, um, because you're, you have numbers. I mean, I remember once I was a student, then I went with Pastor Luby Johnson. He was, no, I went with a minister and he was going to preach in Ivory Coast with Pastor Luby Johnson. And when he got there, I was shocked at what he said. Pastor Luby Johnson told him, he said, you have numbers now, you have money. Go and find out what God really wants you to do with your ministry. Ah, I said, but this man has already succeeded. What are you, are you saying? And I get what he was saying here, that look, when people attain certain things, we have numbers, people recognize a successful minister, and they say that, right? There's a tendency there that what you begin to do is to start, you become a manager and you're no longer a leader. You are not looking for new new opportunities for ministry. You are not pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. You are not going to start taking risks that may show uh, or make you look like a beginner. You are going to, you know, I, I look, and I'll say this here, and when Winners Chapel started in Lagos, I joined them there in September 1989. I, was, I joined them. And I remember a minister came to preach. He was in Lagos. So I won't mention his name. And he kind of, in the preaching, kind of was shading. Because when he got to the place, I mean, we were using a, it was a three-bedroom apartment. Um, sorry, it was, a, it was a block of flats and three floors there. And the base was the church. And this was Bishop, the way I heard about him. And this man came to preach and it was like just the living room. They opened up all this space and some chairs outside. So maybe there were about 300, 400 people. It was a, like a center. And I looked and said, ah, is this the living faith everybody's talking about? And he spoke in a derogatory way. All right. Uh, it was derogatory. About, uh, is this the, the, you know, and all of that. And then and later on, I heard him say somewhere else that Bishop Eriko now invited him to Kaduna to speak. He said when he got to Kaduna and he saw what Kaduna was like, the cathedral in Kaduna, that he understood. But what the point here was that it was a massive risk for Bishop Eriko to have left Kaduna, having been a successful person, and come to Yanopaja there, to a block of flats, where people will look at you, you look like a beginner, is a risk that you are taking there, because if it fails there, all right, then, and all of that, and then the whole thing blew into what uh, it is today here. So I think people, if they get to that particular level, they don't even listen to God again as by in direct instructions. Uh, we've already succeeded in ministry. They don't press into God as they should press into God. And I believe that um, that uh, helps them.
Number two, the people who are associates around them also feel that we are successful. Those associates therefore become managers and no longer leaders, which means we are maintaining what we have. They become uh, gatekeepers and holders of power within that ministry and there's an unwillingness to change anything. And if that leader doesn't read those things early and change the architecture of the ministry that puts everybody in a space where you all get into your uh, uncomfortable zone and begin to stretch, uh, that ministry is going to stagnate and it's going to go on a decline. Wow. 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 I hope you are getting blessed and you are taking notes. Um, in building transgenerational organizations, every organization must be a generating and pioneering generation. Uh, what I've learned over the years is that you see a lot of you hardly see a lot of businesses and organizations that have gone into the third generation because most of the time the first generation is a pioneering generation. They pioneer and they take all the risk. By the time the second generation comes, they become like a maintenance generation. Oh, let's maintain what father has built. Oh, let's not allow daddy's work to die. Oh. And at the end of the day, they enter maintenance mode. By the time the third generation comes, they become an entitled generation and the whole thing dies. Every generation is supposed to be a generating generation. So if you are a first generation person, you are supposed to pioneer and generate things. If you find yourself as a second generation person, you are supposed to maintain what has been pioneered while pioneering new things to reach out to your own world. Because the message of God is the same, but the methodologies are different. The message of God is constant, but the method of reaching your own generation is different. By the time you are the third generation, you are supposed to also continue to maintain the legacy while also pioneering to reach your world. And I'm so grateful to God for that aspect you brought. But um, you have done some of these things, so run us through some of that mind. Because, like you said, you leave a church in Kaduna to come to Yanopaja, and you are like, wow, you know, somebody... So, how have you been able to walk through that internal process of transition, rebuilding, and making sure that this work is, is, is kept? Well, I, I, yes, like I, like I said, I, I think, look, this, this is what really happens in a person's ministry work. No matter how externally successful you are, once it fades within your life and, and we go from one level of glory to the next level of glory, so no matter the glory that has manifested at a particular stage within your life, where you get to a point where, humanly speaking, people say that you are successful, what happens is the indication that God uses that you start getting dissatisfied with that particular position. There's heaviness, there's sorrow. It is not as fulfilling as in you as people on the outside are making it sound. So they are as Jesus, when it was time to go to the cross, he said, I am heavy and I'm sorrowful unto death, which means that there's something, there's, you begin to have that pressure inside. Once that begins to happen, I think you should be very honest with yourself and not define yourself, all right, by the way and manner in which people are defining you. And you go to God, all right, in prayer to find out what the next position is, where are we going to next? What's the next thing um, that we are supposed to do and to do that? To also understand, all right, and this is a major thing, that except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will abide alone. Um, to move to the next level, you there's, there's something in you that um, must, you, I mean, something has to die, all right, in you you about yourself so you you the amount of control so to speak that you have over things will reduce when i say control now which means direct man management over things so now i can have people that is when i open instagram that i see what they are doing all right in a church and oh, i like what you guys are doing and all of that and I see different flavors, people are innovating different things. And so many people don't want to give up that one-man control over the entire process of what they are doing. And if you, if you, if you, I mean, you move from being 
a person who is the sole contributor to a person where you are training other people to contribute their own quota. So you become a, a coach, all right, of other people. You are training other leaders. The, your work, um, the definition of your work shifts, all right. And I, sometimes I think people either don't know, all right, or people look at it um, and uh, they don't want to do it. I mean, for example, um, I mean, when we said we are going to open a church, I mean, people ask me in Abuja, okay. Um, people last night said, look, I said, look, if we go to Abuja, if the work in Abuja fails, it's not, it's a national failure. So, it's a, so, so, right, that work cannot fail. That work is a strategic work. And so, I had to reorganize my own self, my schedule, uh, disrupt things about my own personal life in order to be able to, to coordinate that and make sure that the work uh, went off ground. So I'm not sure whether, I think people, people, and one other thing is, I think a lot of people overcompensate themselves for their success. You know, you know, when you suffered, and you suffered trying to get something going, and uh, finally it's going, and uh, you, you look at it and say, look, you don't know what I suffered. You were not here when I was walking around drinking guys. So you can justify almost anything that you are doing by the suffering that you suffer. And sometimes people overcompensate themselves for that and lose that um, uh, vision for their um, future um, as people. But, but um, that, that shift is, is something that is... Um, is quite um, you have to know that it's a learning curve and that mm -hmm. it's a major shift that you are going to make in your life major shift um you you there are, there are things god will teach you that you never knew i mean you are you're almost learning things like a child so i i, I just feel that if you feel you're a successful person i don't think people are going to want to subject themselves to that for any church, wow. any ministry that starts going down decline, miss a season. In other words, they were to go into another season, and I will hold the set man responsible for that, which means the set man did not read the signals correctly and make the adjustment, and probably it is his own rule that he needs to adjust, that he didn't adjust properly. Wow. Amazing. I mean, so if you are listening to us, we are getting towards the end of this session. And um, I'm going to post the video on IGTV and put it on my YouTube channel. And I've put uh, my website there and the phone number to reach us if you want to be a part of um, um, the Business Sustainability Summit coming up at the end of this month. So you want to get to know how to get some of the materials we've recommended. Um, once again, these materials are amazing. They will help you. Finishing Strong by Stifer, pa Passing It On by Miles Morrow, uh, Young Minister's Armbook by Mike Mudok, The Effective Minister's Wife, by Faith Oedepo and School of Money by Alumide Emmanuel. Get the materials, follow me on all my social media platform. This series starts tonight. Tomorrow night, I'm going to have Pastor Yabi Davids with me on Thursday, Godman Akilabi on Friday, Bishop Shegun Oshinaga. And then next week, we have Pastor K. Ijisheson, we have Jerry Eze, we have Tokpe Alabi, we have Balaji Dogu. So it's going to be every day learning from people on their journey. So, man of God, as we begin to wrap up, let's talk succession. Succession. Now, in the last 30, 40 years, we know of a lot of ministries that the overseer or the founder died and the ministry is no more. We know of some that the overseer have passed on and the ministry is now struggling to stand. We have a lot of our fathers today in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and we can't see any trace of succession. And uh, some are, we have the dichotomy of handing over to children, looking for assistance. Assistance is not there. Some people, they have raised are not there they look back the next generation is far from them um so uh, one of our major frontline ministers passed on recently very painful loss to the body that's a major mega ministry succession became a discussion again we have some of our fathers now great men but you look at them by the time you're looking for the second in command or the next person the gap seem to be very wide so from your own experience having been around how do we deal with this issue of succession so for instance now after Kojo what happened to Covenant Nation? 
So let's begin to look at that. Let's offload that so that those that are coming behind can learn on how to handle this. All right. This is my own, I mean, it's my own personal opinion on this. Um, I, 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 I think you, you are, you, you have to be intentional about succession, but I also believe that you can't, um, I mean, the way the world goes about it, where you plan it to a certain way, I think there's an element there. Now, the reason I would say this, that an element there that it has to be left a divine thought, because ministries that sometimes have overplanned this succession thing um, and so I gave it to whoever they gave it to did not the ministries did I mean let me give an example I think the most powerful transition that is evident we have now is Joel Osteen and John Osteen all right because his father moved that church to 18,000 people and spent about 30 years and the church now is 60,000 people and the reach of the local church is far beyond what his father did. Now, he walked with his father in terms of work, but Joel Osteen did not preach any message in the church until his father, the Wednesday before his father went home to be with the Lord. In other words, that Wednesday, his father told him. His father tried to get him to preach, said, no, he's a background person he was with cameras doing all the background work however god was training him and god was raising him even though he didn't know consciously that he was being trained and raised to take up that work and so when that happened they were they were wise enough to take time and to pray about it and to say that which seemed like the most unlikely among look like among the children all right took it up and the thing exploded so i believe that even if a person doesn't consciously say that I'm planning success of and, and you know, is kind of person, but none of that, I believe that God in every ministry has a successor and has a succession plan that he's working with. The question is whether or not the people can identify among all the people the person that God actually has raised to take over the work all right, from when there is succession there. Now, I believe that if the set man is intentional about succession and is praying about it, the set man will know what is going on. He may not want to, he may not want to expose, all right, the person too early because of, of the, if people realize that, look, this is the person, you know, Look, except you are founder and you are you have you have carried and you know you can do as you want. But but if it's not in that way, it may even be dangerous to expose the person too early that this is the person that we have our eyes on. But I think, all right, I believe firmly that in any ministry, God does have His own succession and what He's doing there, raising up, all right, a successor or successors of whatever he wants to do. The issue there is that even for the set person to be able to identify the right person among all the people that are there for continuity of that work and to do that. So I, I don't think that um, a person getting up and consciously saying that, um, um, I mean, to an extent that this is the person that is going to um, succeed and all of that may not necessarily, may not, for me, may not necessarily mean that that work is going to succeed when that person goes. All right. I think for some people, I think it may not even be wise uh, to prematurely expose a person who they feel should be the successor to that particular thing because of the way the systems around can be. And, and they can do anything to that person because uh, it's it's weird, weird. people can become all right this. So, but a leader should be intentional about it. Should start thinking all right of some time that look how is this work going to go on if I'm no longer around to start praying 
about it. And I believe if a person has even led properly and organized the ministry the way they should, even while you are around, um, that ministry is running and you can see it. All right, this ministry is running or this church is running without, all right, it, at least what we have here can run without my own personal input. Now, it may not be to grow to the next level, but at least what we have on ground, we've been able to organize it, all right, in that um, um, particular way. So I believe uh, people, I also believe that, um, um, I mean, for example, I mean, there will always be a Joshua around in Moses. Uh, it's just that you, you also must understand sometimes, uh, for example, a person can be, let's say a person can be old and the person God wants to take over is not the next generation. It's not even that it can be a very young person. All right. And um, that, that creates, um, there can be a crisis within the system and, and all of that. So, so I, I would just tell everybody to be intentional about it. Know that there's going to pray to God about it. Ask Him to send the person there to train the person that you may not even at that particular point in time. All right, it may be much later that God brings that person to your consciousness that this is the person that is supposed to uh, take this walk to the next level, and then um, you begin to pray about uh, that. But I believe that God always has somebody in the system that can take it forward. The question is whether or not, because it's a, it's a spiritual skill to be able to identify the person or if the Lord tells the person now, you have five more years on this earth. All right, I want you to anoint this person. This person is taking over from you and hold this person's hand for them to take through. All right, but um, 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 I mean, from what I saw about John Austin and Joel Austin, I mean, people wrote Charisma Magazine wrote a major article on why Lakewood Church will fail because Joel Austin is the one who has taken it. They wrote uh, Charisma Magazine a whole article on it, and in and Joel Austin was I mean, he didn't. He said he had to wear his father's shoes the next Sunday for six months. He was afraid. He thought people were going to leave the church. That he didn't think he had the capacity to do it. He was and all of that. But he just saw that the church, all right, was growing and was developing and was all of that. And um, I, I mean, so I, you know, I mean, I mean, if you, you can start a church and people are with you for thirty years and the person who is going to be the successor comes in five years, all right, before that person transits to go home to be with the Lord. So some of those things, uh, but I just believe that, you know, I don't think that the church should approach it um, in the in exact same manner as secular organizations who approach it. I, I do think it's a selection that God makes. I think they should pray about it and pray and call for the successor all right, and um, and make sure that the organization is the place where even when they are around, that organization can move on. It has become an institution and can move on. And then if they go to God in prayer and God shows them that this is the person, all right, it will. But but even if they don't consciously know that it's that person, look, let me, let me give an example. I was on campus fellowship. Even before I became a Christian, the president, of the fellowship who started the fellowship took a likeness to me when the same or even before i became a christian and he, he he would talk to me and talk to me and all over he liked me as a person so by the time i got born again i got into the fellowship there was a likeness that was between us and i think that likeness was divine and he told me something before he left he said look i cannot announce you as the next leader because of the situation that is in this fellowship i can't he said, but I want you to know something from heaven. I know you are the next person who will lead this ministry. Let, let me say this. I had a problem with the executive at that particular point in time. In 1989, 1988, he came from England. 1988, U318 by Barry Hall. 1988. And he said, listen, he said, Toju went to Benin City and came back from Benin City and told me a story. 
He said, he just told me this story before he went in, but that story struck me. He said, he told me a story about a minister's conference he went to, and I want to say this over because I, where Archbishop Idahosa's minister's conference. He said, he told me a story about a man that Archbishop Idahosa was preaching and stopped and told somebody to get up in the congregation and talked about the person that in, and you know, there was people were telling him, don't do it. He said, no, no, people must learn here. He said, in the 70s, this man came and treated me this way in a terrible way and all of that, and how he paid him back with good and all of that. And he said, look, Look at where I am today. And he said, he said, look, be very careful how you treat people because you don't know how people can be anointed and all of that. Close. He heard that story. He just went into the meeting. It was an executive meeting. He said, listen, he told me a story, and I think that thing is going to happen to us. This is what he said in 1988. He said, I think, this is what I, why he told me this story. He came from me and said, he told me this story because I think we are treating this guy wrongly, and one day he's the one going to break through in ministry in Nigeria. And he told them, I didn't forget 1988. He said, you know, and when he breaks through, if Nigeria will know us, it's really because he has come and put us on his platform. He said this in 1988. All right? Wow. Wow. Just like Campbell, he said it. Now, he told me privately, he said, I can't announce to the fellowship this. He said, but when I started this fellowship, and I know inside my spirit, after me, you are supposed to lead this fellowship. He said, now, whatever they do to you, don't leave this fellowship because the future of this work rests on your heart. I'm leaving the mm -hmm. country and I'm telling you this. And he went. Now, he couldn't, because of this political situation, but he was the founder. He couldn't say this is the person because he knew it would have scattered the fellowship at that particular point in time. Mm -hmm. However, one president came, a second president came, the third president came. While the third president was now posted, and that one said, Look, uh, but you come here, by all means, you are the next president of the fellowship. And as I say, all that was history. From the day he said that with his lips, from that day, November 23rd, 1990, I have been preaching twice a week from that day, except I choose not to preach. In other words, it wasn't the presidency to the fellowship that was opened. That was when God opened the door of ministry to me. And since then, I have not stopped preaching the gospel to people wherever they are. So I, so I believe that with um, church, I believe if, if a leader prays, he will know who the person is. Um, that person will be around that particular leader, yeah, even before the leader knows it. God will have brought him into that space. Um, but church matter is it is the God and is some... God. <laughs> God and God can never be stranded. <laughs> God's work, you know, God can never be stranded. He said, I'll build my church and the gate of hell will not prevail. Um, just to wrap up before we close out, for those of you that are listening, when it comes to succession, um, there are three major um dimensions of succession that has been operated within the church uh, when we talk about the church organized church um, we have what we call the apostolic succession and which is what apostolic succession is the dimension of succession where the man in question the president the overseer the pastor or whatever hears from god and appoints somebody to take over because he has heard from god that this is the person to take over the work. The second kind of succession is called Presbyterian succession, where we have a leadership team, a presbytery, like what you have in the Catholic Church, where when a pope dies, then we have the conclave. They will now come and appoint. So we have the Presbyterian succession, where based on the constitution or the setup of the church, we have a group of people based on some specific terms that have been put in their constitution that will now say, okay, these are the people eligible for this, and they make a choice. And then we have congregational succession, which happens in some denomination, where people come up to say, I want to be the one, and it's like politics, they vote for who will win or who will not win, and others. So what we are hearing today is simply be intentional about our succession, but recognize that church is not a business of uh, buying soap. You have to understand that it's a spiritual entity. The church is both an organism and an organization. So while we are talking about organizational management and association, let's not forget 
that there is an organism aspect, there is a spirit aspect, and we should allow God to lead us and take care of his church. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking time out to come. I wanted to ensure that we don't exceed one hour, but in closing now, I wanted to give us your final word on what we have said, and I wanted to pray for people that we will finish well and we will finish strong, because we've been around now over 30 years, we look back, and until we hear, well done, good and faithful servants. We are all still a work in progress. So I would like you to give us your final word, and then I would like you to also pray for everyone. And if you are listening to me right now, please get ready for this prayer by this awesome man of God. And then I'm going to put this on my IGTV and also put it on my YouTube channel. So you can go to my website, copy those number, contact us, and then you can follow me on my social media platform, and then go to Dr. Lumide Man on YouTube and watch this over and over again. This is like a Bible school for you to watch over over and over again, then tomorrow again we'll continue. So, man of God, over to you. Your final words. All right. Well, fi well, final words, I will, just, I will just say this here, that in the journey of ministry, just understand that you are in a journey of um, forgiveness. Understand also that, um, um, and I just want to say this, people shouldn't allow social media perception to derail them. I, look, I will, I will say something that we were blessed in our own um, generation, blessed in the sense that we didn't have social media because social media, you can be popular without being impactful. You can grow fame with social media without necessarily knowing the fundamentals of ministry. You can um, spread a doctrine without having to do the real groundwork and be solidified. You can preach to people today without necessarily passing the test of submitting in the church back then you had to before you could preach you had to go through a system now you can just go and say i'm called of god go on instagram live and begin to preach and believe that you know you're a minister of the gospel of jesus christ without going through it so um let me let me just say this you have to interact with people you have to learn the wisdom social um, interaction with people you have to go through that where you submit to authority within a local church or ministry in which you are in um, let your character be formed let it be developed by the way and manner in which people treat you uh stay true to any ministry that you belong to and, and all of that or church and and strive you are on the path to your destiny so long as you can surmount every ill treatment every hurt or bad feeling by walking in love if you surmount it listen you're on the path to the fulfillment of your destiny if you get offended and wounded the bible says let the limb foot be healed rather than being turned out of the way. If you get offended and wounded, then you get turned out of the way. If I sit down here to tell to a pastor, well, let me just start telling a story about how people have treated him in the past, you can be here and be telling stories of it. His capacity to be able to survive that. So please, um, that's what. I remember meeting a senior minister in this country on a plane, and I said something to him. I said, how come you are still around? And all of your colleagues got offended and faded. He said, you answered the question. They got offended and faded. I could have gotten offended. I didn't. And that's why I remained and with impact. And you know of me today. Right? So offense will always bring, cause you to wither and reduce your impact in ministry. Okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single person. Your servant you called into ministry celebrating 34 years. There is something that he has on his heart. That's why he has reached out into his network to bring in people so that there will be a blessing unto people at large. That which he has inside his heart, may every single speaker be granted utterance to speak those words that at the end of these sessions, he will be satisfied within his spirit that the work was done and the transference occurred. And I pray for every single person listening, Lord, that the prayers that they have uttered in secret places 
will be answered in this series and in these interviews. Young ministers that are plugging in to listen, to gain direction in critical areas of their lives, that are struggling through certain things, may they answer to the cry of their heart, come out of the lips of your servants that he will interact with in these IG live sessions in the mighty name of Jesus, such that we will see ministries in future who will refer to these conversations as the turning point that your servant will meet with people in airports in different nations that will say thank you for those sessions. They changed and transformed my life and saved me from critical mistakes I will have made in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you, you very much, Charles. Thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I must, I must, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm going to, I'm inviting you to our church next year for, for something, and I've been thinking about it. But I just want to tell people, hmm? I, and I'm saying this from my heart, um, it is impossible to listen impossible to listen to pastor Dubide Manuel and not be blessed um his grace is rare the simplicity and the wisdom that he passes across I mean I was listening to something you did on the view where you were talking about some things it sounds funny but is loaded with wisdom it passes life-saving information across to people and um I know a little bit about you, and I know it has taken courage for you to say this is your own individual ministry to the body of Christ, because it's different from what what we will call people around you and influence around you. So it has taken a determination on your own part, a sense of purpose, all right, to choose that particular path. And I want you to understand that we listen to you, we are blessed by the words that you speak, and we thank God for the ministry. Huh? Thank you, man of God. I appreciate you, man of God. Thank you so much. God bless you. So everyone, God bless you all. Tomorrow night, 8 p.m., Pastor Yemi David. Tomorrow night. So follow me on my Instagram handle. You can follow me now. Just go to the Instagram handle, Olumit Emmanuel, and follow me so that you can be a part of it, so that you can get a notification when we come on board tomorrow. And I'm going to put this video on IGTV now, and I'm going to put it on my Instagram and on my YouTube, Dr. Lumide Emmanuel on YouTube. And then the seminar, the conf uh, conference coming up on Friday the 29th. Friday the 29th of September is Business Sustainability Summit. It's a fully residential event at the Sheraton Hotel in Kedja, Lagos. So you come in and then you stay and leave on Saturday morning. And then there's also an opportunity for those that want to be there, non-residential. So call the number on the screen. I think uh, registration is supposed to have closed, but I think we still have a few slots left. The fully residential is um, 500,000. Non-residential is um, 350,000. So call them and see if there is still some slots for those of you that want to register so that we spend the whole day together. But it's primarily for business people. It's not ministry inclined. It's for business people how to build a transgenerational business and keep your business sustainable. So thank you very much. God bless you all. I'll see you tomorrow night. Pastor Yemi David will be with us tomorrow night. And it's going to be another amazing time. So God bless you all. Um, have a nice night. Don't forget all the book I recommended. The School of Money book. Very important. The Effective Pastor's Wife. Very, very important. Passing it on by Dr. Mike Morrow. And then the Young Minister's Handbook by Dr. Mike Murdoch. And then Finishing Strong, Finishing Strong by Steve Farr. Those are materials that I believe will also help you on your journey to sustainability. So save that number on the screen. That's the number to reach us on, 0091447423. Whether it's phone, whether it's WhatsApp, whatever way we can be a blessing, whatever way we can assist you on your journey, whether in ministry or in business, as an apostle in the marketplace, we'll be willing to support you and help you and then if you want to get um, any of the um, materials we've spoken about, we can also link you to some bookstores that carry them, and you can also get them online. So see you tomorrow, Ulumide Mano and Yemi David. God bless you all. Bye for now.